Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the XNMO Wineco podcast. My name is David Clark. Today on the podcast, we have Johan Reinecke of Reinecke Wines, uh, just a total weapon of a human being, a uh, farmer in the Polkadra Hills of Stellenbosch. We talk about his journey into wine through law and through philosophy, into organics, his journey so far and his continuing journey. He's a, just a wonderful human being. Stick with us. Well, welcome to the XNMO podcast. I have with me one of my favorite people in the South African wine industry, Johan Reinecke. Welcome. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. It's yeah. good to be here. Absolute pleasure. My absolute pleasure. Um, Johan, for those who don't know you, or we've got a bottle of the Reinecke wine here, mm. talk us through your life before wine. So I know there's a, there's a fair bit there that wasn't sort of, I mean, it's not like you, you mm. were born into a wine family and inherited an estate and all that sort of stuff. What's yeah. your story into wine? Okay, so I grew up, I was born in Pretoria. Okay. Uh, my parents moved to Cape Town when I was young, primary school. My dad got a, a teaching post at UCT. Okay. And um, in my matric year, he got offered a job at Stellenbosch University. Mm -hmm. And my mom grew up on a farm and she wanted to live on a farm. So they bought a, a house in the countryside in the Polkadra Hills, mm -hmm. about 10 k's out of Stellenbosch proper. <clears throat> Excuse me, and um, it was interesting. I went to university. I started off studying law. It wasn't quite my thing. Um, I fell in love with philosophy. Uh, did it my degree? Did my honors degree? I was busy with a master's in environmental ethics. Okay. And then my wife, uh, who was my girlfriend at the time, got a job as an au pair in Pasadena in LA. Okay. And I was told, you know, if it was true love, she'd be there in a year's time. And I, I kind of stuck it out for who, about who, a month. Who told you that? Did she tell you that? Uh, or my someone parents. Else? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I stuck around for about a month and I was like, no, nah, I'm oh, out of here. All right. So were you in Pasadena? Yeah. So, oh, right. so I got a, a ticket. I actually got a student loan to buy a computer and I bought a plane ticket. <laughs> And then I was off to the US, <laughs> right. and she quit the job, and we stayed there for a year. We lived in a van, mm -hmm. and um, it was awesome. And then yeah. we came back. So she was only an au pair for a month as well. Am I getting yeah, she or? went like yeah, exactly, pretty okay. much a month or two. Yeah, and then when we came back, it was there were a few things that happened. One is my hair had grown very long and unruly in America. Okay, and in fact, I started. I got. I had dreadlocks. Right. Which in the 90s wasn't commonplace in South Africa. Yeah, right. And my parents were pretty pissed off yeah. that I'd upped and left. So they told me, you know, if you're old enough to do that, you, you need to look after yourself. <laughs> yes. And the combined effect of those two was that I was struggling to find a job. And the only one I could get was as a farm laborer. Okay. As a vineyard worker. What year is this? This must have been around about 93, 94. Okay. At that time. Yeah. And so a fair bit happening in South Africa at that time as well. <laughs> Very much so. Very much so. So, yeah, I started working as a farm worker. I fell in love with the vines. They were okay. awesome. It's such a nice place to work in. Mm -hmm. And nature, it was outdoorsy, it was quite physical, and it just resonated with me. I, I thoroughly mm -hmm. enjoyed it. And then after a few months, I decided to, to continue my studies or resume them. Okay. And then I... Yeah, literally doing environmental ethics in the evenings and working in, in the vineyards in the day. And then I got to a point where I felt increasingly uncomfortable with what I was doing. So Which part of what were you doing? Well, I suppose what, what working with herbicides and pesticides and oh, pesticides. so the farming side of things. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I was doing. I was just mm. a well, I didn't know if it was the environmental ethics or yes. the farming side. <laughs> getting a control with Hundred percent just the farming side of things. Okay. Uh, the guys who really influenced me were Arnie Ness uh, from Norway, Aldo Leopold, uh, Isan County Almanac, Thoreau, a couple of other people, mm -hmm. um, uh, Silent Spring. And you know, I think with knowledge comes obligation, and you can't just like, forget about the stuff that you become aware of. Mm -hmm. And then as a worker, I just didn't enjoy working with these potentially hazardous chemicals and things. Mm. So I got to a point where it was a funny thing. Um, my parents had a, f a small plot of land with a few vines on them. Uh, in the area where we lived, there were other neighbors as well who had small portions of land. Mm -hmm. 
And they wanted to live there, but not necessarily farm there, because it's a hard job and it's a risky job. And they liked the countryside, but they could get a better salary if they worked in town or, or elsewhere. Mm. And because I was the only white guy in the team, the assumption, fresh after apartheid, was that I was the, the manager, okay. which I wasn't. I, I knew less than anybody else. Mm. But then I got a few offers. Um, people came to me and said, listen, um, if you want to, you can run our vines as well. Mm. And um, out of that grew a very small little farming business where I grew grapes and uh, sold them to a few cooperatives. And then I got to a point where I decided to pull the trigger right about 2000 and go organic. Okay. Yeah. And that was the beginning of things. So that's, that's kind of what I did before, all things wine. And um, yeah. A few questions about that. What, yeah. what, 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 I mean, you, started, you said you started with law. Yes. And then fell out of love that or with that or what, what was the, what was that process like? It just wasn't me, you know. Okay. What, so, what part of it wasn't you? Okay, the law part. <laughs> <laughs> so we, <laughs> we what the, what the, 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 okay, the, no. the exactness <laughs> of it or the complexity of it? I mean, I just, it, it doesn't seem like you shy away from complex things. Not at all. I think you must, uh, you know, time is precious. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that you do what you like to do with your life. Mm. And we, in, in South Africa, we've, we had this Roman Dutch law system that we inherited from the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And um, What did you call it? Roman Dutch? Roman Dutch. Roman Dutch, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, one of the subjects you had to take was Latin. Okay. And I quite liked that. Right. Uh, I, I remember Ars Longa Vita Brevis, art is long and life is short. Mm -hmm. Um, but I really didn't uh, enjoy some of the other stuff. And, um, but what, what was that stuff you didn't enjoy? I don't know. Just, okay, just, uh, just give me an example of two or uh, three. Like, what was the... I just don't see myself as a lawyer okay. or as a legal-minded legal, legal minded person. Yes. Um, I was doing a, a... So you can do a BA law and you can do a B, BCom. Mm -hmm. And I had to do a few subjects as well, uh, like additional ones like philosophy and... Uh, political science and other ones that I did uh, at the time. And I just, um, I think, gravitated my personality mm. more to the humanities right. and to arts yes. rather than, um, I just couldn't see myself in a legal profession one day. It just okay. wasn't my thing. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Uh, it was a, a, something and I aspired to become. Yes. But it just didn't sit well with me or with my, yeah, I suppose my nature Fair as enough. a person. Yeah. And did you feel like a bit of an outsider in amongst your, your, uh, the student body in the law um, f uh, faculty? Did not really. No? Okay. Um, not really, no. Okay. I, so, not at all. Yeah. I think, um, if anything, I partied too hard and studied too little. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> students That's a bit of a rite of passage. Yeah. Though, yeah. I think. <laughs> Um, and I really only kind of got my groove in my third year. Okay. And I, uh, you know, it's funny, you come across people in your life that really kind of influence the way you think. Mm. And I met, uh, I was quite rebellious in school, mm -hmm. and that continued through uh, my first few years at university. But somehow there was something about the philosophy lecturers that I appreciated. They had a sort right. of open-mindedness about them and a mm -hmm. tolerance for you know, diverse viewpoints and, mm. yeah, I just felt more comfortable in that space. Yeah. More of a non-conformist space, if I can put it that way. And um, I could see it in my marks. Um, those were the best by far. Yeah, and they right. got better and better and better. And I was, I suppose, just playing to my strengths. And so when you made the change yeah. to philosophy, did you have sort of like a grand plan in mind or were you just, as you say, following sort of what you were enthusiastic about and what felt right. There was no like, I'll do philosophy, then I'll do this or... No, there was a, there was a grand plan. I always wanted to affect positive change mm. in the world. And I remember at the time there was a story in a newspaper about a guy who grew vegetables in a UNESCO World Heritage Site uh, called the Duku Duku State Forest in KZN. Okay. on the east coast and uh, hippopotamus came and ate his vegetables and then he took a gun and he shot the hippo right <laughs> so there was this massive outcry on the one hand you know how can you grow vegetables and shoot wild animals in a unesco world heritage site mm -hmm. and then there was an equally great outcry on the other side 
You know, in a country with abject poverty, how can you be more concerned about the well-being of a hippopotamus than that of a person? Yes. And these are <clears throat> typical, you know, polarizing thoughts. That yeah. People tend to sort of park in one camp or the other. Yeah. And I just wondered if there wasn't a synergy somewhere that one could take a step back and look for a solution where you could sort of reimagine things so both the person and the hippo would be taken care of. Mm. And um, that's actually what my thesis was about, was to try and look at this interplay between environment and development. Okay. And then I looked at the different phases or the, the depths of approach of, of, of development, sort of very superficial would be I don't know, gene per capita, and then you would go to basic needs, and mm. then I got to Amartya Sen with this whole capability to choose, and on the environmental side, it was sort of very shallow, you know, nature was created for us to, to exploit, mm -hmm. to sort of a slightly deeper approach, uh, we're there to look after it, and with it comes a responsibility mm. to deep ecology, where we are a part of nature. And I was like trying to figure out with you know where I found myself, hmm. and to see if I could somehow bring the, the loose ends together. Yeah. And um, I didn't have a particular job in mind. It was more just a task, I yes. suppose, that I wanted yeah, yeah, to address. Yeah. And that's what yeah that was what 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 to, still today. It's funny that I'm you're asking me these questions, but they actually, in you know, hindsight, if I look at all things Rainica, they've kind of manifest over the course of the last twenty or thirty years. Yeah those principles quite strongly. Yeah, they haven't gone away, they've just kind sort of solidified and exactly and intensified. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I might ask you about the baboons in, um, in Constantia. Because, <laughs> I mean, the, you're telling that story about the hippo. I mean, it's, you can transfer that to the, yeah, sure. you know, a few years ago there, were, yeah. there was a baboon cull yeah, yeah. Uh, in Constantia around the vineyards. Yeah. Legal and approved and, yeah. and there was absolute uproar and there was... Yes, on both know, sides. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's, that was, uh, you, were either, you were either this side or that side. There was, there was no room for... <laughs> So, you so see. yeah, so you see. people haven't read your thesis clearly. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's a good thing. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and environmental ethics. Talk, talk to me about that. What, what did that encompass, and why was that so passionate? Uh, why were you so passionate about that? I mean, clearly you're in, in okay, passionate so about the environment. Yeah, so uh, it's a it's an interesting thing. So uh, I've always loved nature. Mm. Um, I think I was exposed to a natural environment from a very young age. Um, my mom was very fond of all things nature. Yeah. So wherever we went, uh, whether it was to the mountains or the beach or the bush felt or even at home, animals and pets and flowers and things. Um, I was always, from a very young age, it was sort of shared this, this passion of all things wild and wonderful. So, I, 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 yeah, I um, do this day, it's an interesting thing. I, I find nature a very special place to go to, mm. to recharge my batteries. I yeah. like going for a walk or a hike in the mountain or going for a surf. Um, often... I, I don't think I've had a conversation with you about any topic where you haven't mentioned surfing. And surfing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, just, you sort of pull it back around somehow. And <laughs> That's my thing, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How often do you go surfing? Oh, so no, not how often do you want to, but how often do you actually okay. do no, it? So, okay, it depends on, on, on work. So there are times yeah. when like, I surf often, like this past weekend, I surf three times a day, every day, all day. Yeah. Uh, I was invited to a, a mate's uh, 50th on the west coast and the waves nice. were firing. Right. You can see I got a nice tan. Yeah. Um, but then there are times where I can't, where I have to buckle down and work. But I like to, you know, if I can, I'd say about three times a week. Okay. Uh, if I could, I'd go every day. Yeah. And do you get a bit grumpy if you can't go, or? I do get a bit of grumpy if I don't go. Yeah. yeah. It's it's where I find my peace. Okay. As a person. Right. Yeah, for sure. Um, jumping back to farming, mm. um, you said 2000 when you were make the the decision to go organic. Mm. Uh, were you full-time farming at that point? What was your situation at that time? Were you still sort of farming on behalf of people? or So a bit of both. Yeah. Um, I kind of reached the stage where I realised to find employment as a philosopher wasn't going to be easy. Mm. Um, my mom was a nurse. Uh, she started the hospice in Stellenbosch and she ran the farm. 
and things kind of ground to a halt for various reasons, financial and otherwise. Mm -hmm. And we had a, a family discussion where one of the options was to sell the, the land and move on. Mm -hmm. And then I can't believe that one makes such big decisions at such a young age. But on the spur of the moment, I kind of suggested that, that they give me a chance to try and run the farm. Mm -hmm. So I got, I got stuck into it. Uh, but I really wanted to do it. In your mid twenties here, or yeah, more I'm, less? A, I'm a youngster. Yeah, mid twenties, early twenties. Mm. Um, yeah, with a degree in in, in philosophy mm -hmm. or two, and that was it. <laughs> uh, no farming background. Yeah. Um, but back in the day, there was a lot of, I suppose today also, a lot of help available from consultants in the industry. Yeah. Um, university helped a lot. Mm. Um, but I wanted to do something different, and I tried to do something different. So I, I removed all the things that I didn't feel comfortable with, like the herbicides and the pesticides and the fungicides. Mm -hmm. And I failed. Did you do that gradually definitely. or just? No, I did it in one go. And a cold, small, cold, cold turkey. Small portion of the farm, fortunately, and it was a complete and utter disaster. All right. Yeah. Now, I'd, like, we've got a thick book in South Africa called Vingerbo in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And um, viticulture what, in South just, Africa, yeah, vineyard, uh, vineyard, vineyard management, vineyard. and um, I had like every pest, plague, and disease you can find in that book. In that <laughs> vineyard, you? Six months. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was chaos. You were the reference. <laughs> know, man, it was so embarrassing. <laughs> and I, I even had a, quite a prominent person from the academic part of the wine industry coming to the farm, mm. telling me, you know, if you've got even if you have no respect for yourself, I, you know, at least show some for your neighbours. Uh, there was this oh, right. fear that I was going to create this pocket of disease that would spread and contaminate everyone around me. So, like kind of a peer pressure almost. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, well, more than that. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't peer. Well, yeah, yeah. 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 But um, it's funny that because, you know, I, I've always been brought up to try and do the right thing, mm. what I believe in. Mm. And I really thought I was doing the right thing and clearly didn't work out. Mm. But, you know, life is funny that way. Sometimes you must just stick it out for a bit longer. Mm -hmm. And it's, like they say, it's darkest before dawn. Mm. And then things came right and they came right in a big way. Um, the first thing is that, interestingly enough, the person who taught me philosophy at the, at the time, uh, uh, Professor Johan Hartung, and taught me environmental ethics, told me that he had heard of this lady in Wellington and she farmed in a very unconventional way mm -hmm. that raised a lot of eyebrows in her community. And I, I met this lady, her name was Jean Mulherby, mm -hmm. and she was the doyen of all things natural and organic, uh, biodynamic back in the day, mm -hmm. um, but not claiming it. She was just right. well known for the quality of her fruit and her veggies and her flowers. Yeah. Um, but there was, she wasn't doing it under the hospices of organic or... Nothing whatsoever, just, yeah. yeah okay. Uh, she, I mean, she knew it, and, yeah. and, 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 but she, she, like she did it for the quality and for the love of the land. Mm. And then I met Sean, and um, she came to the farm and she had a look and she said, my dear, you are uh, organic by neglect, you need to be so by design. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. And then that was the, the start of a, a long educational journey mm. where I had to learn um, yeah, just how to farm without those uh, things that I didn't want to farm with and to yeah. understand that, that farmers use them, not because they like to use them, but because they have to. Mm -hmm. And if you're not going to use them, you'll have to find other natural or sustainable or whatever solutions for yeah. those problems because they're not just going to up and leave. Yeah, the problems aren't different. You're, the solution has to be... Exactly. Yeah, but you have to... There has they're to be like, a solution. Yeah, they're not yeah. going to go away by themselves yeah. like I have. So my farm was yeah. basically returning to wilderness. Mm -hmm. And then I understood that somewhere between wilderness and this modern agribusiness, industrialized agriculture, mm. in the middle of that lies the old art of farming. Mm. Uh, agriculture as opposed to agribusiness. Mm. And then that was a it was a wonderful time. We used to go through every Sunday and have lunch with her and then she would just read me books and, and educate me and get me to yeah, think along different lines about 
plants and weeds mm. and pests and soil and everything. And what else. was she farming? Uh, she farming grapes or not at all? No, okay. Um, so she had quite a mixed farm. Mm. Uh, lots of veggies, uh, lots of fruits. Mm -hmm. uh, and was it a, was it a commercial farm or, um, or partly really. a hobbyist sort of commercial? No, no. She lived. That was yeah. what she did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so okay. she didn't have other income. Uh, she sold some milk. She made some yogurt. Um, okay. She Just self-sustainable almost. Uh, the, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah more, 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 more like a sort of a self-sustainable farming entity than mm. a commercial farm in the modern sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, um, that's awesome. You mentioned Pogodry Hills. Mm. Maybe for those who uh, haven't been there, mm. talk to us about where it lies, what it's like. You know, the lay of the land. So if you go. So Stellenbosch is quite diverse in terms of what it offers, all things viticulture. Mm -hmm. And you've got the different wards, and some are better known and some are lesser known. And I think the Polka Dry area was traditionally uh, not only a lesser known one, but uh, least favoured one. It was seen as a very, almost a, a poorer era of the greater Stellenbosch. Mm -hmm. And um, it's on the road between Stellenbosch and Kals River. And when you go there, it's this series of hills, they granite outcrops. Mm -hmm. So way back, it was under Table Mountain sandstone, and this all got washed away. Mm -hmm. And now you just have these granite hills that, that stick out. And what people are discovering now is that they're pretty awesome mm -hmm. because they are, um, it's a very specific special kind of granite that decomposed where that granite that gives a very different profile that one would get for example from granite soils in the Swartland. Mm -hmm. um, the nice thing is that they face south mm -hmm. so they all look towards the ocean and being in the southern hemisphere that's the cooler part. Yeah. Um, I'm talking now temperature mm -hmm. and I think if you think of, of global warming yes. and changing environments that's a, a big plus increasingly so. Mm -hmm. And then I'm often, or people are often surprised by the altitude of the vineyards. So if you go to Elgin, for example, um, which is traditionally seen as a very cool climate area of Stellenbosch, I remember Elgin Ridge, the farm had this 282 on the label. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the altitude of the vineyard. I believe so, yeah. And uh, I mean, we've got some calves that grow at 300 meters above sea level. Mm -hmm. So it's Stellenbosch, but it's facing directly towards the sea. It's mm -hmm. about 10 to 14 k's away so every morning at about 10 o'clock you get that sea breeze coming in the southeaster cools things down a lot mm. and i think it's it's really um yeah coming into its own now i think there's a lot of work being done next door also at, at curry Burp with all the guys making their wines there mm -hmm. some really interesting wines coming out of that yeah and, and the rods guys down in flottenberg and donny karinas obviously rianan and everyone else mm. So I think it's, uh, and my neighbors, yeah, the Turin as well, everybody's starting to put that area on the map. I think it's a very exciting area going forward. No, it's very exciting. Yeah. Um, it's the most uh, westerly part of Stellenbosch. Yep. Um, the closest to Table Bay on the other side. Do you get much influence from Table Bay or does all the influence come up from... You get both. Um, so if you stand on the hill, you can Bay. actually see both oceans. Yeah. But I think given the prevailing winds in summer, yeah. most of the influence comes probably south. comes from the south, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very from cool. False Bay. Very cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Rainica, when did it start being Rainica? This, this, uh, when did it become sort of an entity? So it was a very interesting thing. So what happened was I was growing grapes for a number of sellers at the time. And I then dabbled with all things organic and initially failed dismally and then got the hang of it. Mm -hmm. And it became quite successful. And I then approached some of the, the buyers and asked them if they weren't interested in making an organic wine because I had organic grapes. Mm -hmm. My grapes would just go to the cooperative and be mixed with everyone else's. Yes. And uh, a lot of people thought it was a very bad idea that <laughs> organics was a, a bit of a fad that would pass in a few months. Yeah. And so was this 03, 04, somewhere there? Or? Yeah, before even, around about 2000, yeah, 2001. Okay. okay. And then around about 2003, 2004, um, it's funny, I mean, I'm looking at this wine on the table. Mm. Uh, we were busy pruning um, Cabernet, and it was 
freakishly cold. It was a, a autumn day, uh, a August day, which is a midwinter or middle of the cold spell for us. Yeah. And I got really cold and um, I went home in my breakfast break and I put my wetsuit on and put my overalls and my shoes on. And I went back to the vineyards and then I kind of had a bit of a schmarmy look on my face, looking at my colleagues, like, look at me, how clever I am. And then I saw that all they could do was take newspaper and put that in their shoes and in their pants and in their shirts. And that kind of sucked because, you know, wine is beautiful and we can't really make beautiful from ugly. So I just, the, the, the absolute poverty of all things farm labor, I just, just wasn't, wasn't a good thing. Yeah. And um, we then went to the different farmers that we were working for and we asked them for a raise because we got paid very little. Mm -hmm. But it was a difficult ask because of a number of reasons. So as, as you know, South Africa's got a very high unemployment rate. It's officially 30, uh, unofficially probably closer to 40 percent. Um, and then farmers also, you know, people think farmers are wealthy, but they, they're kind of capital rich, but cash flow poor. So they may have vast tracts of land that's worth a lot, but very often they don't have a lot of money in the bank and they kind of have their backs against the wall financially. And you know how the wine industry works and how capitalism works. You know, everybody adds and builds and adds and builds and the, the primary producers very often are the runt of the litters, with the exception, of course, of the farm workers who are even, even lower on the rung of the, of the ladder. So that, that wasn't met favorably. And then I thought, well, maybe... And you, were selling to, you said you were selling to the co-ops as well. Um, I was selling, or were you starting to sell was, to private sellers as well? I was only selling to, to co-ops, yeah. different co-ops, mm. but I was farming parcels of land for different farmers oh, and see. working on different properties. Okay. And then I thought, well, maybe what we can do is uh, make our own wine, right. become rich. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Smash it. Uh, easy. Yeah. yeah. So might, might take you six months or so, but. <laughs> Yes, totally typical <laughs> student of philosophy. Eh? Yeah, yeah. No, no, nothing about commerce or anything, just philosophy, yeah. philosophy, idealistic, 20-something. And then um, we had a, a small little cow shed. We had two cows, Daisy and Clanky. I moved them out of the shed. Sure. I bought a, <laughs> shame indeed. I bought a, a broom, I cut the bristles off, and we got a second-hand barrel from a, a mate and chucked some cab grapes in there and crushed and pressed and made a little bit of wine that I was very proud of. It probably sucked, you know, in yeah. hindsight, but at the yeah. time I thought it was great. And I then invited the bank manager to come and um, lend us um, a million or two so we could kit out our car shed into a proper winery and, mm -hmm. and, and, and pull ourselves up by our shoestrings or bootstraps or whatever the metaphor is. Yeah. So this guy had a, he had a good laugh. Um, right. He's like, just don't go there, man. Right. <laughs> um, rich people enter this industry and they become poor. Yes. These guys are poor already. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't know anything about viticulture, oenology, or commerce. So your chances are very slim. On paper, it wasn't a great idea. It wasn't. <laughs> but as I mentioned before, I've always had a bit of a non-conformist, rebellious streak. Mm -hmm. And that then really kicked in. And yeah, I okay. was like, man, if there's one thing I'm going to do, it's, I'm going to prove him that we, we're going to do this. Yeah. Then unfortunately, my colleagues declined at the time. Uh, they thought it was a bridge too far. Mm -hmm. And they opted instead. It was interesting. So that was a bit of a bummer. And then I took a leaf out of Amartya Sen's book. And he said, you know, if you want to empower people, you give them choice. Um, if you want to disempower them, you remove their capability to choose. So I asked my colleagues what they chose, and they chose housing and education, and that's where the whole cornerstone story comes from. But that was the beginning of Rainica Wines. Okay. So we made wine in a cow shed for a few years. I had a, a good mate, a guy called James Farguson. Mm -hmm. He was a winemaker at Leafland. Uh, he joined me for a while, um, and we started things off, and then he got headhunted to another company, and I was really, uh, it was hard times. It was mm. early days, struggling. So uh, what, what, what was the first vintage of a Rainica wine labelled? Uh, so uh, probably 98, 99, mm -hmm. um, but very small amounts. Mm -hmm. 
and then through 2000 they picked up a bit and then around about 2004 ish if i recall correctly there was a a, a distribution company called Vinimark mm -hmm. and they distributed my wine and they seemed to be very successful mm -hmm. and then i asked if i could speak to the the ceo the owner a gentleman called tim rands mm -hmm. And um, if you would give me advice, because I would also like to be successful. And yes. I thought I was doing all the right things, but somehow the money wasn't forthcoming. Yeah. And it was very interesting. I actually struggled a lot to get an appointment with him because he was very busy. Mm -hmm. But I persisted, and then eventually he literally gave me half an hour. So I came in with 20 questions, and he answered none of them. <laughs> and he just asked me questions. Yes. And then I, I had a similar <laughs> meeting with him when he was, when he was still alive. Um, and I and yeah, all I did was didn't ask him one question. He just <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I left there a little bit disillusioned. Yeah. But it wasn't long after that, and then the phone rang, and he started a, a JV with another well-known South African brand, mm. and they spotted a opportunity in the Scandinavian market. Okay. Uh, where consumer trends were train, uh, changing towards more sustainable mm -hmm. organic uh, yep. wine consumption, mm -hmm. and they wanted to have a have a in in that market. Right. And they have a brand that fit that sort of profile. Uh, yeah, and they, they were going to do a, a collaborative effort. Yeah. And but they needed a jockey to do the vineyards. Yep. So they, which was great for me. Yep. So they offered me a, a salary. Uh, or a consultancy fee, mm -hmm. and for, I can't remember, it was a few months or a year, I worked on that project, and then for some reason, that thing didn't fly. Okay. Um, and they, they both pulled out of it, and then at that time, I kind of pulled up a bit of a rapport with Tim, and it's a very interesting person. He was incredibly astute in all things finance, mm. but he also had a, I wouldn't call it a slight esoteric t touch, but he had a sort of a, he was just a very, very, very interesting person. Mm. Super intelligent mm. and not conventional. And um, he used to love to come to the vineyards. And it was like a party trick. I could take him to a neighbor's land and the swell would be rock hard. And then mm. I'd take him into our vineyards and it would be like a sponge and chocolate cake and, yeah. Chocolate yeah. Cake yeah. and yeah. all of that. So he came and he came and he came and uh, yeah, uh, over and over. Mm -hmm. And then I was actually on my way to the beach one Friday afternoon. <laughs> Shock horror. <laughs> uh, going for a surf. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I got a call from his PA, Evander, and she said, listen, uh, Tim wants to speak to you. And I was like, okay. Like, when? And she said, no, as, as in now. And I was like, well, is it really important? Because I'm almost at the beach. It's Friday afternoon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is it more important than my surfing? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, and it's funny I asked that because normally I would just say, I can't, I can't now, I, I can do it next week. But mm. she said, well, you know, I, I, I can't tell you, but if I were you, I'd probably see him, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was like, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, whatever, you turn back to the farm. Yeah. And I met him there, it was a Friday afternoon, and that was in 2006. Okay. And he was so cool. He, we walked up and down the farm, and he wanted to look at the soil again and understand all things organic again. And it was this way and that way, and he wanted to taste the wines again. And then he asked me if he could buy equity in Reineke wines. Mm -hmm. And it was a compliment, but I thought it was going to be a very short-lived affair because on paper, I had a cow shed and a, a few barrels and a few tanks and not mm -hmm. worth much. But in practice, I'd put in a lot of blood and sweat and tears and many years of my life already, although yeah. I didn't have a lot to show for it. Yes. And I wasn't going to sell it for 50 bucks, you know, or half of it. Mm. And I just thought, you know, it's not going to go anywhere. And I tried to explain this to him, and then he just cut me short. And he said, you know, uh, don't talk to me about money, um, just because that's not who you are. Just talk to me about what... what about your dreams and your aspirations and what you want. Mm. So I said, like, what do you mean? And he said, no, if you, if you, you know, if like, there must be a few things that you want. And I said, oh, absolutely. You know, I'd, I'd love to have a salary because I'm not going for a surf. <laughs> 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 uh, I, I didn't have a salary, man. I, yeah, I yeah. you know, you'd pay the bills and then yeah, you'd, yeah. You'd, like, living living out of the business. Living out of the business, which yeah. was always a disaster. Mm. 
Um, I kept on bumping my head on this uh, beam in the cow shed whenever I did punch down, so I dreamt of having a proper wine cellar one day. Yeah. And uh, Mila and I and our eldest daughter, Isabella, we were still living in a small little laborer's cottage in, on the farm. Mm -hmm. So a house would also be awesome. Mm -hmm. And then I could only use about 20% of the grapes that I grew, and the rest just got lost in this mass of conventional grape production at the local cooperative. Mm. And it would be nice to make wine from that as well. And then I'm it, sorry, did, why yeah. were you selling the cooperative? Because you just had to live, you just had to get cash? Just, yeah, absolutely, just yeah, to live. Okay. Yeah. yeah, just to live. And, and sometimes bulk wine as well. Mm -hmm. And then he said, cool, I'll make you a deal. You give me 50% uh, share in your brand, mm -hmm. I'll make sure you get a salary, a house, a wine cellar, and we make wine of all of your grapes. Mm. And I was like, you have got to be kidding me. You know, do you want to think about this? And he yeah. said, no, you need to think about this. I, I know what I want to do. Mm. And um, if you're up for it, uh, come to my house uh, next Friday afternoon in Franschhoek, and we can sign the documents. And I did. Mm. I got there and uh, signed the documents. He lit up a cigar. And um, the rest is history. That was 06. That was 06. Yeah. And he was such a cool guy. I just want to actually say this as well before we go into other topics. Mm. But I, I, much later on, he became ill and he got cancer. And I always struggled to connect with him because he was such a force of nature that mm. people were almost scared to get close to him. Mm. Sort of intimidating. Yes, but, yeah. but not really. Okay. I think it was more in our perception. And he, one day he told me, you know, it's lonely at the top. Mm. And I thought... Uh, you know, you're very intimidating. You're super sharp and super astute and everything. Mm. And then I said to him, you know, how can I repay you? How can I pay it back? And he said, no, you must never, ever uh, repay me. What you must do is you must pay it forward. Mm. And apparently when he grew up in Cape Town, his dad passed away when he was very young. And his mom struggled to put him through school and pay for his cricket and stuff. Mm. And, and then a mate's dad stepped in and helped him and sent him to school and to uni. And then when he became rich and famous, he wanted to pay this guy back. And this mm. guy said, no, just pay it forward. And I was one of many people he apparently helped in his life. Yeah, wow. Yeah, awesome. Very, very cool. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're still with that's 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 the, um, there's still the, uh, the understanding of the agreement today, so. Absolutely. Yeah, so nothing's changed in that sense. Yeah. Okay. And I haven't seen any contracts since that day that we signed them in 2006. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And how much, awesome. how much wine was Reineken making in 2006? Under Reineken? Like, can you ballpark it or do you know exactly? I or? can. I can. Um, so if I think back, in yeah, monetary value. Or, yeah, how, or, or volume or whatever. Or volume. Yeah. Okay. So let's say I was making... Because money, money to value yeah, with, with the rand is a bit, yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit dodgy. dodgy. It's a bit dodgy. So let's say <laughs> of the biodynamical reserve range, I made less than a thousand cases. Mm -hmm. And today, uh, of these guys, we make about 15,000 six packs. Yeah. And then the organic and vinegar ranges are getting close to about 45,000 six packs. Nice. So it's been a phenomenal growth. Yeah, right. Yeah. We've got a, um, a UFO landing outside, it sounds like, but uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll power on. It is Woodstock, so if they're, they're going to they're gonna land anywhere, they're going to land here <laughs> amongst their own kind. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, talk to me about the vineyards more. Um, uh, I mean, you're not a winemaker. No. Uh, even though you were sort of involved yeah. in the wine, have you stepped away from that over time, or do you still are you still involved, or no? So what I, or I are you in just you're you're the vineyard person? No, I think it. This is a it. there's a Dutch lady I must thank for this. Mm. She's got a very very interesting name, Dagmar van Ravenswijk Klaassen. Jeez, that's a that's no, a something to pronounce. Yeah. And she was a, a friend of ours at university, and then she became incredibly successful in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. in all things business. Okay. A and she came via Land Rover with her fiancé, traveling from Amsterdam through Africa to Cape Town, and the, she joined us for a harvest on the farm for a few weeks. And I, she worked with me for three weeks, okay. we picking the grapes and making the wine, and she was actually starting to take a bit of wine back to the, the Netherlands, and I, I then asked her, thanks so much, 
you know, you've done all these courses and you're so successful, just dumb it down to farmer level and give me a bit of advice. <laughs> and she said, um, okay, well, what you must do is you must surround yourself with people better than you. Mm. Otherwise, you're gonna limit the business to your ability mm. or inability or whatever. Yes. So I just set off trying to do that. So initially I, I was the winemaker, or for a time I was a winemaker, I was a farmer, I was a marketing guy, finance guy, admin guy, all of the rest. Mm. And um, yeah, we just got better people uh, mm. employed. And, and today I, I still like to be involved with everything. Mm -hmm. But um, I suppose in some areas more of a supportive rather than a, a hands-on role, but I yeah. like to, to to know what's going on and, yeah. and, and, and to be a part of it. Um, at my most recent job was I was still the farmer, but now we've got a, a young guy called Ishan, who is a much better farmer than I ever was. Mm -hmm. And he's taken the whole farm and all things organic and biodynamic to the next level. Okay. But I think my passion lies in the vineyards, yes. for sure. Um, yeah, and I, 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 I for, for various reasons. Mm -hmm. I think a, a vineyard is a really important place for a passion to lie. So, I mean, we can talk about it for days. So, yeah, I mean, we can talk about what we do in the vineyards, and we can talk about why we do those things in the vineyards. Yeah, well, maybe start with the varieties that you've got planted there and why they're planted there. Yeah, okay. So, in our area, on those granite slopes, there seem to be a, a few cultivars that really shine there. Mm. Um, Syrah for one, mm -hmm. um, the two cabs, Cabernet Franc and Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, perhaps even more so Cabernet Franc. Okay. Uh, Shannon seems to be doing really well. And then we've got just a few small parcels of Sauvignon that also seem to shine. Mm -hmm. And we've built a business around them. In the past, I've experimented with Viognier, with um, Pinotage, with um, Chardonnay over the years and I pulled all of them out because they just didn't, they were okay, yes. but we wanted to do yeah, better than okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. And so what's the, what's the, the, the obviously this, you said Sauvignon Blanc is a small percentage? Yeah. And is it relatively even amongst the others or? Um, I think so at the moment, but going forward it's probably going to be more Syrah and Shannon. Okay. And then... Is that new plantings? Um, that's new plantings that we're doing at the moment. Okay. Yeah. And so, so talk to me about the, um, the, the area. So okay, so that's awesome. The, so, the yeah. farm you have is how big, how much of that is planted to vines and what's the... So it's, 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 it's changing and it's growing. So when we started, the mm. first little part of organic vineyard was about 0 0.24, so a quarter of a hectare right. of vines. It was yeah. actually Pinotage. Yeah. And then it became 11, and then it became 20, yeah. and then it became 40. And then, like, literally over the last year or two, there's a beautiful farm next door that came in the market. And um, I was always the grower producing the grapes and selling them to Rainica Wines. Okay. And when this farm came on the market, I just couldn't let it go, knowing what the areas capable of and what the potential is. So I approached the, the, the people of Animark, <coughs> in particular Tim's um, children, uh, Abby and Sven, mm -hmm. and they were awesome. They said, okay, let's commit to this. Mm -hmm. um, initially I wanted to buy it in Rainica Wines, but that would have just been, you know, diluting our focus a bit and, and you know, we're still trying to grow our brand and our business and to buy land is expensive to develop, but even more so. Yeah, yeah. So they actually committed and um, invested in this beautiful 80 hectare property next door. Mm. And we're working with viticulturalist uh, Rosa Kruger. Mm -hmm. Tony Rosa, yes. That's the one, yeah, the one yeah, and only. Yeah. And she came up with an insane uh, design mm. where we're trying to put together all her experience in viticulture and all ours in all things polka dry, organics and biodynamics. And I think we came up with a remarkable design mm. um, that I must give her credit for. And it's kind of a, it's all about quality. Uh, I suppose improving on what we have in the bottle at the moment. Mm -hmm. And then it's also about all things land caring and land sparing. Uh, land caring being uh, the ability to sequester carbon, all things regenerative agriculture, all things global warming, um, 
and then land sparing being focused on biodiversity. Okay. Uh, yeah. And how does that manifest itself in the design? What, what, what makes it, as you say, crazy design? So, uh, okay, if we talk about quality, mm -hmm. um, the, the, we, st we really had an in-depth look at the plant material we use, the rootstocks we, we select. Mm -hmm. um, we've obviously had 20, 30 years of experience next door on our farm to see what works better and what works worse. That helps. It helps a <laughs> yeah, lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Suited there. <laughs> Uh, we looked at very specific clones of the cultivars that we found work. We looked at the, the you know, the vineyards that we have that really shine and um, other ones that we think could perhaps be even better. Then we looked at things like row directions, um, which seems like nothing. Mm. But what we want to do is we want to, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. If you look at the farm, you're going to see rows almost coming over the hill at the top of the hill mm. where we're planting a block of sira. So traditionally I would have planted them along the contour mm -hmm. not to get that er erosion happening. Yes. But what Rosa commented was that if you plant along the contour you create a terrace mm -hmm. and the sidewall of the terrace dries off quicker than the top part of the terrace. Okay. So you'll have some of the roots dry and, and some not and this is it's okay, but if you want to go for the best, mm -hmm. that is not the best. So she wanted to plant them down the slope, and I didn't want to because I wanted to angle them a bit so that we didn't get the erosion. Mm -hmm. And then, fortunately, the wind came into play. And we found that if we angled them, not only would we find a happy balance between those two variables, yes. but we would also align them in such a way that they would catch the sea breeze and the draft running up from the ocean every day. Yeah, and let, and let it through the vineyard rather than against exactly. the... Exactly. Yeah, right. So okay. that works very well. Mm -hmm. And then depending on the steepness of the slope, we would mm -hmm. make the rows longer or shorter. Um, they could, we could calculate you know, the, the speed, the run of the water, not to get erosion on the farm. Mm -hmm. So that would be a, a, a sort of, just sort of quality things. Yes. Um, we also looked at Shannon. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a, a block of vines that was born in 1974 and I don't know if you remember but a few years ago there were a couple of French guys coming to South Africa to, to sort of document and catalogue some really special old vineyards yep. and they took cuttings and massal selection and um, we got Vititec to clean up virus-free, propagate them for us. Mm -hmm. And then we really liked Eben's, uh Mrs. Kirsten, and his Skirfberg as well. Mm -hmm. So we're getting some of that plant material as well. So we're kind of working with what we think would be three excellent examples of South African Shannon. And when we want to create our own little blocks of each in the farm. Um, so a whole lot of that in terms of, of if you're thinking of, of quality, and then also trellising mm -hmm. systems. Yes. So some, some would be bush vines, some would be raised bush vines, some would be trellised, um, whole different uh, canopy management systems, uh, yeah. which, you know, actually Rosa must talk about because she's mm -hmm. better versed in those, but I think I'm, I'm really optimistic about what we're going to get out of those vineyards over the next five to 10 years and then going forward. Well, it's interesting to, say, to hear you say that because it sounds like <clears throat> uh, similar to what, something you said before is that we're just, we're looking for different solutions to the same problems. Mm. And that could be, as you say, different trellising within the same mm. farm mm. because, mm. you know, there's different from aspect to aspect sure. to, uh, you know, to um, different areas within the farm requires different solutions to the same Absolutely. problem. Absolutely. How much is wind a problem for you there? Is it a massive it, issue? It uh, depends exactly like you said now, it depends yeah. where. Yeah, okay. So if you go right on the top of the ridge, mm. it is a big problem. Okay. Because the wind bumps through there. Right. And we've got a block of cab at 300 meters above sea level, mm. and it's a trellised system. And we had to take the wires off because what happens is you get the gale force winds coming through and then it just keeps on cutting the canes off at the wire and right. then the length of the cane is not enough to give you proper phenolic ripeness on the grapes. Right, okay. So in adjacent areas now we've planted similar vines but, but we've decided to do like a, a pole per vine and, okay. then, and then kind of gently tie them up the canes onto the poles as well and they seem mm -hmm. to withstand the wind a lot better. And then as you move down... Almost like the Escheler system, is that...? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. And then if you move down the slopes, you might have 
pockets that are a bit more vigorous in growth mm -hmm. that you want to accommodate in another way, but wind is not so much of a problem. Right. Or if you come over the hill, you might have a bit too much sun and you want to you know, make sure that you don't have bunches that bake in the, in the afternoon sun. Yes. So you might change the row direction a bit so that the, the sun goes over the length of the row and, 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 and doesn't hit the grapes from the side onwards. Yeah. So it, it's, a, it's not rocket science, yeah, yeah. but it's just the experience coming to the fore. Yeah. And the, the emphasis is on, on really, it's like a swan song. It's, it's, it's you know, how many brands or, 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 or wine companies can you build in a lifetime? Mm. I mean, I suppose some people can do many, but mm. for me, it's probably just going to be one. Just the one. So, <laughs> it's big enough. Uh, I just want to <laughs> do it as well as I possibly can. Yeah. And I think, I mean, Larissa's track record speaks for herself. If you mm. look at the amazing work she's done for the Mother News and everywhere else where she's worked. Yeah. Uh, it's incredible. Uh, yeah. And no, I, I spoke to her uh, yeah. for the podcast uh, a few years ago, and she's a, she's a wealth of knowledge. Oh, uh, 100%. Yeah. So that's, that's all things quality. Then land caring is this idea of... So global warming is real, mm -hmm. uh, for, to me at least. Mm -hmm. I know they have always dissenting views on everything, mm -hmm. but I believe it is... Uh, some, something to be concerned of. Mm -hmm. And if I look at it, like most things, it's not really a, a linear progression. It's almost like an exponential curve. Mm. So it seems to be an acceleration, yes. according to the information we yes. have. Yeah. yeah. And what really sucks is that agriculture is one of the five biggest drivers of global warming mm. uh, on the planet. So as a farmer, I don't really want to get up every morning and be one of the five biggest drivers of making things worse, worse for my fellow man or woman or my kids or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, if you flip it around though, and if you farm in a regenerative fashion, farming or agriculture can become one of the most effective tools we have to sequester carbon and to slow things down. Mm -hmm. So that's just, it's just, you know, the many roots up the mountain, there's sustainable farming, there's regenerative farming, there's organic farming, there's biodynamic farming. Mm -hmm. um, we chose the organic and the biodynamic path for, 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 for various reasons. Yep. But what you do essentially is, why I like biodynamics so much, is it kind of moves the needle from, if, you were, if I was a conventional farmer, my primary motive would have been profit. I'd see the farm as a business and I want to make as much money as possible. Yep. If I'm an organic farmer, I want to do so in a sustainable way. So I still want to make money, but I want to do so in a way that is sustainable for future generations as well, not to... Mm -hmm exhaust that piece of land just for my own benefit. Yeah. And then if I'm a biodynamic farmer, I move the needle from being sustainable to becoming self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. So you create a circular economy on the farm and then you're not so reliant on external inputs, be they, be they conventional or organic to keep on farming. Mm -hmm. So it helps from a business perspective. It's not completely altruistic that we're just trying to do it for nature. Mm -hmm. um, it makes our business more resilient Mm -hmm. as well in the current economic climes. But what it does do is two other things. It stops being part of the problem of accelerating global warming. And it also develops the ability to mitigate the disaster to a greater degree. Mm -hmm. Because as you increase the humus levels and the things in the soil, um, your water retention ability improves. Mm -hmm. So if it rains less or more sporadically, which it does in global warming, you can have save more of that water, it reduces the runoff, so you're less susceptible to erosion. Um, your vines don't have these mega canopies, so the optimal transpiration rate requires less water, which is also kind of where we're heading in future. Mm -hmm. And then, um, like I said, yeah, you, you're sequestering carbon by building humus, soil humus, so you stop being part of the problem. So that's all things land caring. And does that have, a, obviously, a flow-on effect in quality with the, with the fruit as well? No, I believe that, yeah. and I... Because I, I, uh, if, if it made the fruit worse, even though it sequestered carbon, it would be a difficult decision, I would have thought. Or maybe, no, no, maybe a, 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 a more difficult decision. Yeah, so, yeah. No, well, I'm with you, because quality kind of trumps everything. Yeah. Well, it, it, it depends on where you stand, I suppose. Uh, but, no, yeah. In my experience, yeah. people will buy a wine because it's organic mm. once, but if it's not good, they're not going to buy it twice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So good point. you really need to, to, to back things up with quality. Yeah. But what I did find is if you look at the Reinecke scores and, 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 and ratings over the years, mm. um, there's a definite jump in 
in quality perception, mm -hmm. whether it's South African or UK or American or European wine critics. Yeah. Uh, now it's causation, correlation. It could be different winemakers. It could be a whole bunch of stuff. Mm. But on the whole, it could be better PR as well. Uh, it, could, <laughs> it could. But but last year I was asked to do a talk in New Zealand for the Organic and Biodynamic uh, Wine Growers Association. Yeah. And that was so interesting. Mm. Uh, they had academics there from various universities uh, and they all, all, all did their presentations. And one of the things they came up with was that they'd run this exercise through wine people. So MWs, uh, SOMs, uh, people who knew and understand wine. Mm -hmm. And they'd give them wines to taste and, and then they compared the tasting notes. Okay. And they didn't obviously tell them what they were looking for beforehand. And what they were trying to isolate were, or trying to find was whether there were specific variables that popped up with organic and in particular biodynamic wines. Okay, like characteristics within the yes, wine. Yes, yes. And they did, okay. And uh, topics that we've surfaced through most of the notes were things like vitality in the wine, right. freshness yeah. and aliveness and this yeah. and that. And um, so I think it, it does make a difference. And mm -hmm. I do think it does make a, a qualitative difference. Mm -hmm. And if I look at, just if I take it away from wine, if, if, like veggies, mm -hmm. if, I mean, we grow tomatoes and stuff. Mm -hmm. And if I compare them to the tomatoes in the, in the store, I really... <laughs> it's a different... I, I, I it's really, a different comparison, yeah. Yeah, but to me, no. I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I honestly find them more flavor, flavorful or flavor yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 But I'm biased. I'm batting for this team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's taking a pinch of yeah. salt, but that's me. Um, can I um, zoom in on the biodynamic side of things? Sure. How did that come about? What was your introduction to that? Um, the biodynamic the farming or that, that approach to. So biodynamics was, was weird. Mm. It still is. Um, it's super esoteric. Mm. So it doesn't have to be there. Um, so what happened to me is. I was just lucky or whatever to meet John. She helped me with um, all things organic and biodynamic. <laughs> what John told me was that if you, she, she, okay, so. This is Wellington John. Yeah, this is, yeah. The, so, so the first part of call was organic by neglect versus by design. Yeah. So the idea was, you know, you have to manage weeds in a different way. You're not gonna use Miranda. Mm -hmm but you're going to have to make another plan. You can either remove them mechanically or you can try and outgrow them. Whereas mechanically would be kind of perhaps more just conventional light. Mm -hmm. So you want to still control and dominate nature, whereas outgrow them, you're looking for synergies within this nature realm. Uh, same with pests, instead of using snail bait, get ducks, and instead of using systemic fungicides for downy and powdery mildew, use trichodermia or tabulite or whatever, uh, mm -hmm. rather than copper, which is mm -hmm. organically allowable. But what was very interesting was the, was the feeding of the vines after harvest. Okay. So it's a bit like imagine you run a uh, marathon mm -hmm. and then you have to basically recover with a good meal so that you can run again. Yes. So you spend all the energy, you need some of the energy back. Exactly. Okay. So you've taken all these tons of grapes off your vineyard, and mm. now you need to put something back. So in the conventional mindset, you, you can quantify, I need to put back so much nitrogen and potassium and phosphate. And then you go and buy that mm -hmm. in bags, superphosphate or land or whatever, and you put this down in your, in your vineyards, and, and the plants will grow beautifully. Mm -hmm. The organic farmer's objection to that is that it's, it's fine for the vines, but it's not great for the soil. Yep. Uh, you're killing off your earthworms, your microbes, you're acidifying the soil. If it rains heavily, it's going to leach into the rivers and the waterways. Mm -hmm. and the algae will overgrow and there won't be enough oxygen for the fish and the frogs. And you know the whole mm -hmm. story. So the organic farmer wants to use an organic fertilizer. And that's mm -hmm. typically animal manure that's composted and pelletized, very often chicken manure. Mm -hmm. And you then spread these things and there's a whole host of them. And then they still feed the vines what they need, but they do so without destroying the soil life. Mm -hmm. But the biodynamic farmer goes and he or she will buy a cow and bring the cow to the vineyard. Mm -hmm. Now that was a, it was a funny thing because I was farming with grapes and I really didn't want to look after cows 
as well. Mm -hmm. They weren't my thing. I wasn't a cow farmer, and mm -hmm. I kind of thought, okay, <laughs> if I think grapes, I must farm with with vines. And yeah, John explained to me two things. Um, the one was that if I did it properly, it would be it would negate the necessity to to buy stuff to farm. So it comes from. Give me a, a second. I'm just going to take a step back. Mm -hmm. So the godfather, if there is such a thing, of biodynamics would be Rudolf Steiner. Mm -hmm. And he wrote numerous books, and one of them was Agriculture. And in Agriculture, he refers to a farm as an individuality. And the metaphor he uses, he's trying to conjure this image that if you as a person or I, if we're sick, we're in hospital, we've got all these pipes to keep us going. But when we're healthy, our body has been created in a way that kind of your heart and lungs and everything looks after each other when everything is healthy. And he saw with the advent of, of industrialization of agriculture that farms became more and more dependent on external inputs to survive and in his mind less and less healthy. Mm. And also in the flavor of the fruit and the food that they produced and also by looking at the effect it had on the soil and the nature on the farm. And, and that. So he was, he was trying to go back to this, this idea that a farm should be seen as a, a self-sufficient system as a unit. Mm -hmm. so, what you need on the farm, you grow on the farm. So you can imagine, uh, I'll give you a fact. So I used to spend, let's say, 100,000 rands a year on fertilizer. Mm -hmm. And then I spent 100,000 rands a year on certified organic fertilizer, probably a bit more because it was more expensive, more expensive. than the conventional, yeah. conventional fertilizer. But as soon as I got the herd of cows, I made compost. And that cost me all of 12,000 rands to make. Mm. And I never had to buy fertilizer again. Mm. And my yields actually increased, and they mm. got to where they were when I farmed as a conventional farmer, the same uh, level, mm -hmm. uh, except now I saved 100,000 rands, and I could actually sell an additional 100,000 rands of oxen and heifers out of the herd. Mm -hmm. So I diversified my income stream. I had mm. a net gain of 200,000 bucks on the farm, mm -hmm. and I liked that. Um, so that's one, one concept of biodynamics. The second one is this idea of waste, yeah. which I think is a cultural concept. It doesn't exist in nature. And if you create a holistic farm, it also reduces waste. Mm -hmm. So if, I make, if I'm just a wine farmer, mm -hmm. regardless of whether it's conventional or organic, mm -hmm. I'm going to have a mountain of pips and stems and skins outside the wine cellar. Mm -hmm. So I have to do something with them. If I chuck them over the hill, when nobody sees them, I'm going to sort of fire the soil there and things won't grow there. Right. Okay. So I have to pick up the phone, make it somebody else's problem. They go and dump it somewhere else. I forget mm -hmm. about it. No, I pay them yeah. for, the, for the privilege. Yeah, and the convenience. And the convenience. Yeah. But, but I mean, that's, that's similar to the fertilizer. So you're, you're swapping money for convenience. Right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So now if I have a herd of cows, if they are conventionally farmed, I feel really sorry for them. Um, because they, they stay with their moms for nine months. Mm -hmm. Then they must go to feed lots. They're going to eat all kinds of things that this doesn't naturally yeah, uh, they uh, suit to, to them. And they go yeah. on a cocktail of antibiotics and growth hormones, and then after 55 days, they get, get slaughtered. And that, in my book, that, that sucks. So if they're farmed organically, they grow up within the herd context. Um, they have you know, at least a bit more of a decent life. Eventually they will also be eaten, but, mm -hmm. but it, they will live outside. But if, regardless of which of those I do, wherever they sleep, there's a buildup of manure. And mm. that's very high in nitrogen, which is also not good for that soil. So it also becomes a problem. Mm. But as a biodynamic farmer, if I align both systems, it disappears because I take the waste from the cellar and I feed it to the cows and I take the waste from the cows and I put that back into the vineyards. So you, you cut out all the production costs, you reduce the waste. So that was the easiest part of biodynamics for me to latch onto as a newbie. Yes. Because the rest was too far. Okay. And then I went a little bit deeper, mm -hmm. and it was about the concept of value. Mm -hmm. So uh, commercial value. If you, if you think of, of value, yeah. most people think of money. Yes. What is the value of something? Mm -hmm. But if you look at people, um, in a business, mm -hmm. like the people who work at Rainica Wines, they all have jobs and they all get salaries. Yeah. But to be completely fair to them, they, they bring more than just what they paid for. Mm -hmm. So the person who works in the office also brings companionship, um, sometimes humor, uh, empathy, mm -hmm. whatever, you know, they're people. Mm -hmm. So one must 
recognize that inherent value of people as well, above and beyond their commercial value that they offer to the business, mm. the humaneness of people. Mm -hmm. Now, it's the same with, with animals in biodynamics. So cows aren't just seen as objects that produce beef or milk. They're also subjects. Mm -hmm. They have different personalities. They, you can milk them and you can eat them, mm -hmm. but they bring fertility to the land. If you sit with cash flow problems, it's like the best place to go because they just call me right down. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're beautiful yeah. to look at. Yeah, they're not, they're, they've got their spreadsheets open. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I like, that was like a, like a little bit deeper into biodynamics is mm -hmm. to, to have a respect for the inherent value of things as well. Mm -hmm. So if you see a dandelion growing in your vineyards, mm -hmm. it's not just a weed. It perhaps plays another, another role. Mm -hmm. And we found out with leaf roll virus and the spread of the saliva through the millibug, mm -hmm. uh, I used to spray them back in the day. Uh, now I don't have to because they live on the roots of the dandelion. So now I understand that this is the home of the insect and if I'm gonna take this cold, hard look at weeds and just kill all of them. Yes. I, I destroy the house of all these living things and I then crawl in the vines and, and, and cause problems there. Mm. So it's a deeper understanding of, of, of value, if I can put it that way. Mm. And then it goes a step further. It goes to this idea of the biodynamic preparations. Yep. And then the idea is that you've got two of them. Uh, field ones, the 500 and the 501, the horn silica and the horn manure, mm -hmm. and then you've got 503 through 507, which are essentially herbs that you used in your composting process, like valerian and chamomile and a bit of oak bark and stinging nettle and uh, dandelion, mm -hmm. and then you've got 508, which is equisetum, which is high in silica that they used to spray against the honey. Mm -hmm. So. There is a, it's a bit of a hawks and doves movement there. If you're going to mm -hmm. speak to somebody like Nicolas Jolie or the true esoteric biodynamicists, they take a very strong spiritual understanding of why those plants and those preparations work. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to take a slightly less intense scientific approach, you can also find explanations. Uh, for example, if you look at the preparation 500, the cow manure and the cow horn, you can think of microbes and soil life and things like that as mm -hmm. opposed to, you know, cosmic forces. Yeah. So, but, so in that scientific approach, could, the, could you get the same uh, results by a slightly different method? And would that still be biodynamic to you? Or how dogmatic are you there on that sort of, sort of type so, of thing? So... Uh, I'm growing as a person. So initially I was highly skeptical of the esoteric and spiritual nature of all things biodynamic. Mm. So if I use preparation 500, I assumed what I was doing is I was inoculating the soil with beneficial microbes. And I could see it work. Mm. I could see the texture improving, the soil became soft. Mm -hmm. uh, you spoke about the chocolate cake or the soil structure improving. Yeah, yeah. And it worked. Yeah. And I did comparative studies where I would use preparation 500, but I would also buy microbes from a Dutch multinational com uh, company and put them in other rows. And mm -hmm. they also had a beneficial effect. Yes. They were just like 10 times the price. Yes. So that's why I stuck to the, the 500 and, and, and made it myself on the farm. Yes. But it's, it's a funny thing. Mm. So when I was young, I grew up in a super religious family. Okay. Uh, to a degree where I almost started rebelling against it, like mm. I did against most things in my life. Yes, a bit of, of anti-authoritarian. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> very much so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's me. Yeah, yeah. So um, then I got to a stage where I basically thought all of these things are, are it's just like nonsense. Mm. I don't believe in that stuff. And um, it's a funny thing because I had a mom who was super religious mm. and... She got cancer and she got it four times and when it was the fourth time and the final time, I had very difficult discussions with her. Mm -hmm. And she knew she was dying and I knew she was dying mm -hmm. and we had to talk about it. And it's, you know, on the one hand, I wanted to not lie to her and be honest about what I felt and what I believed. But on the other hand, I also wanted to, I mean, here's a person dying. Yeah. There's no point in sort of, you know, yeah, getting her upset. Exactly. Yeah. And, and this is her belief system. Yeah. 
So I found it really difficult to be truthful and honest mm -hmm. and full of empathy at the same time. Yes. And um, it's a weird thing, man. Mm -hmm. But uh, oh. would have you done it differently looking back now? No, or? no, he didn't. N yeah. Nothing. Yeah. But what I'm trying to say is, after mm -hmm. she passed away, some I had some experiences that I cannot explain to mm -hmm. this day, and I thought it was my mind playing games with me and me imagining stuff and just in a highly, you know, very high emotional state. Mm. But it's a funny thing, David, as I get older and I'm now, I'm not old, but I'm turning 53 this year, mm. I can see there are certain things in me that are diminishing and they would be my physical capabilities. Mm. So I'm not as, as strong and as flexible and as mobile as I was in my 20s. Yeah, you've, but, really, you've really let yourself go, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but what I, what I do find is that, I, call it, I don't even know what to call this, on a spiritual level, mm. things have started growing that, yeah, that there yeah. never was before. Okay. So I like to, to take... Are those two things related, do you think? I don't or know. is it incidental? Like it's I, I don't know. Coincidental. I don't, I yeah. don't know. And I, I'm not a religious person, but I'm, I'm starting to develop uh, to a capability to, attack, uh, to entertain the possibility that there is a spiritual realm yes. as well. So you're not religious, but you're getting more spiritual. Yeah, I wouldn't even say getting more spiritual. Yeah. I'm just accepting that perhaps there is something. Okay. So, and I'm not sure what it is and how it looks and, and, and what, what, but, but things have happened and, and continue to happen that makes me have respect for the bits and pieces that I don't understand, okay. if I can put it that way. Yeah. And I, I like that about biodynamics, because if you look at these bright lights shining on us, mm -hmm. you get a, a super clever person figuring out how that light travels from there onto my or your arm, and, and, and they assume it's, it's light moving in waves, and then they, they build this experiment, and they show it to kids all over the world, and then everybody can believe it, and it's peer-reviewed. Mm -hmm. And then you get another smart person that makes a different assumption, it's, it's particles, and they do the same. And, yeah. Then the understanding comes, it's particles and waves. And the, 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 the moral of the story is they were both right in their understanding, but neither were absolute in their understanding. Yeah. And I think this is just the common nature of knowledge in general. So we know a lot as people, but there's also a lot that we don't know yet. And I don't know what that is, and I can't talk about that with authority, but I just want to be, like I have conviction in what I believe and what I understand, but also there's a certain built-in conditionality that there might be more to the picture that will be become apparent yeah. downstream at some point, yeah. either through science or so through, you're not, through you're whatever. You're not doing this from a point of hubris. It's, it's no. through a point of humility, it seems. Absolutely. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. So I like that about biodynamics is that it, it kind of keeps this thing about farming very real and very practical. And, and, and it, it works as a farming model and it's great for the land and it's great for the animals and for everyone. Mm. But it also keeps open this, this, this idea that, you know, it's a privilege to, to be part of all of that and there mm. might be, you know, something more to the picture. But it's a very slippery slope and I don't know what's mm. going on in that space. I don't want to talk about it too much. Mm. But I, I appreciate that it leaves the door open for people who feel stronger along those lines than I do. Yeah, yeah. very cool. Yeah. And once the grapes are grown yeah. and they're harvested yes. and they're uh, starting the, the winemaking process, how much input do you have uh, in a macro level in terms of stylistic or philosophical approaches do you have? So it's a very good question. I think people approach wine from different angles. Mm. And in a way, I would hate to be a winemaker because they cannot help themselves but to look for faults in the wine. They want to avoid problems and faults. Yes. So if you're a winemaker, you, you know, you're looking for your faults. This is your craft. What is wrong with it? Yeah, How can yeah, I yeah. fix that? You yeah. know, is there a bit of bread in there or is it this or is it mousy or is it that or mm. is it da 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 da? Is it too, is it phenolically ripe? Is the alcohol too high or too low? Is the mm. acidity right? Is How balanced is the wine? Mm. So I don't have to bring that mm. to the table. That's what the winemakers bring to the table. Mm. So in a way, my position is a lot more relaxed. Um, I want the wines to be truthful. I want them to be honest. 
I want them to be unadulted and I want them to be unique. Mm -hmm. I think what's... What, How unadulted? What's your sort of... What's your... Okay. The, I mean, I don't, I don't want to need you to be super detailed, but just give no, me a broad, no, broad I'll, sense. I'll of, tell you. So, yeah. so I, think, I mean, what, what, what sets wine apart from Coca-Cola or beer or any other beverage is this mm -hmm. sense of place, this concept of terroir. Mm -hmm. So I... I really appreciate that about wine. Mm -hmm. That it's, it's almost like you buy a book of a farm. Yep. And, it, and a specific year on that farm. Yeah. And it should tell that story in the nicest possible way. Yeah. Um, so it must be honest, yes. but it must be well told at the same time. Yes. So there is a place for intervention, mm -hmm. as in you can be organic by neglect or by design. Mm -hmm. It needs to be by design. Mm -hmm. But I'm not a fan of gymnastics in the cellar. Mm -hmm. So overly oaked or... Uh, I don't know, tartaric acid or da 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 It's nothing too transformative. No. Yeah. So what I've, I may not know a lot about wines of the world, mm -hmm. but I've had quite a number of years of, of, of drinking our wines. Yes. And I've developed a feeling for them. Yeah. And I just, that's what I look for yes. when I taste the wines. And yeah. that's, those are the kind of discussions I have with the winemakers. So, mm. I understand the principle that you want to surround yourself with people better than you, so I don't want to mm -hmm. micromanage anyone. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they have better capabilities, all things winemaking, than I do. Mm -hmm. But I, I feel comfortable giving my, my feedback mm -hmm. honestly about how I experience the wine. Yes. And, 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 and why I feel, feel that way. And, right. and, and, then, and then they interpret it however they, and they do. need to. And yeah. they can explain that, you know, a lot mm -hmm. of the... The, the things and, and very often agree, sometimes disagree, but there's mm. always a healthy, not a, de de not a debate, it's not about having the final say or the final word, it's, mm. it's, it's, to, it's for both parties to get a better understanding mm -hmm. after the discussion, rather yes. than to have one person enforce their will or their way on yeah. the outcome. Yeah. And does it go the other way? Do the, sometimes one makers go back to you and say, look, we, we'd love the cabinet to be you know, riper at a lower alcohol or, you know, what, 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 has, there, has there been that sort of feedback going both ways? Or? This is a classic example. If you look at this specific wine prior to 2015, yeah. uh, there was a stylistic change after 2015 qu quite dramatically. Okay. So what happened is I did a, a wine tasting in London and one of the guys who also did a wine tasting was Gottfried Mock from Bukerotskliff. Mm -hmm. And he's obviously like one of the top winemakers out there. He's a bit of a weapon. You know, yeah, he yeah. knows his stuff. Yeah, yeah. So he, the wine was quite austere, and it always was austere. Mm -hmm. and, um, but it was honest and it was unique. Mm -hmm. And then he looked at it and he said to me, you know, I like this wine a lot, but the, the, the austerity is a little bit too much. Mm -hmm. Why don't you consider using a little bit of new oak for mm -hmm. the Cabernet component? And then I said to him, but well, why do you say that? And he said to me, well, you know, if you use a new barrel, there's some natural sugars in the wood that gets assimilated into the wine. And if they toast the barrel, there's a bit of oxygen trapped behind the toasting. And the first time you use it, that also gets assimilated in the wine. And the combined effect of the two might kind of soften this austerity somewhat. And then it's going to be slightly richer. Exactly. Yeah. Slightly richer, fuller. Mm -hmm. um, expression of the wine and then we we tried it and it, it it worked and then we actually changed course after that yes um if i look at so rudiger gretchel is also very instrumental in all things wine for reineke mm -hmm. and through the years i mean when we started we had cabernet sauvignon cabernet franc merlot this was our Bordeaux blend mm -hmm. and then he picked up that over the years the merlot kind of lost its shine a bit, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps because our soils aren't clay-based clay enough, but okay. more granitic. Yes. So the Merlot was really pretty initially when we did the blends and we bottled the wine. But over the years, it, didn't, it wasn't the best component in the wine. With timing bottle, you mean? With timing bottle. Yeah. But he picked up that the Cabernet Franc component seemed to really do the opposite and actually improve with timing the bottle. Mm. And then eventually we moved the, the Merlot out and we did a Cab Sauv, Cab Franc, and now we slowly but surely are putting in more Cab Franc and less Cabernet Sauvignon. So it definitely goes both ways. Yeah, yeah. awesome.
Yeah. Awesome. I know you're not the marketer. Oh, the marketer? Yeah. For yeah. Renica. Yeah. Uh, or nor the salesperson. No. But maybe run us through what, what Renica is producing at the moment in terms of ranges and lines and... Okay. Yeah. So we're going through quite a big change at the moment, to be honest. Hmm. Um, we've got a reserve range with the Reineke uh, etched in the, in the bottle. Okay. And then we've got the biodynamic range, which so is... the reserve range the top? It's the ones. top tier. Okay. That would be the Syrah, yep. uh, a cab, mm -hmm. and the reserve white, which is the Sauvignon Blanc. Perfect. Okay. And then we've got a second tier, which is the biodynamic range, which okay. is the cornerstone yep. that we have here. Uh, and Syrah as well, a Shannon, the old vine Shannon, and a Sauvignon Blanc. Okay. And then we had more the commercial range, which was the Reineke. Uh, it's also um, a Shiraz Cab, Cab Merlot, mm -hmm. a Shannon, and a Sauvignon Blanc. Mm -hmm. And those are the one with, with the R on the label and that you find more in en masse uh, mm -hmm. across the world. So we got called out for the carbon footprint of our bottles. Yes. By <laughs> yeah. a few years ago. Yes, I remember this. By a lady who tasted for Jancis Robinson. Yes. And I really took it to heart yeah. because I welcome criticism. It really, it's necessary mm. because, you know, if you surround yourself with yes people, then you're not going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And as long as it's fair and it's honest, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, yeah. it's brilliant. Mm. So we looked at this and she had a point. Mm. So we went back to the drawing board. And we said, what, what, what's, what can we approve upon? So I don't know if you can see this, but this is a type of, a, I think it's called an acid edge in the glass here. Okay. And that's a disaster because to do this, you have to actually warm up the bottle a second time. Right. To 500 or 700 degrees Celsius to, to put this on the bottle. Uh, like to soften it out so you can get yeah. it in. Okay. So this, this is, this is, this is uh, it's not, we're not going to do this going forward anymore. Okay. And then we looked at the bottle weight, and that was a little bit more complicated than they initially assumed. Um, they looked at bottle weight and assumed that the heavier the bottle weighs, the bigger the carbon footprint. Mm. That is true, but again, not absolutely true. There's other truths as well. Okay. So one of the things that we picked up was it's not just the bottle weight, it's the percentage of recycled glass, yeah. and it's also the... the electricity used to manufacture the glass. Mm. So it was funny, but we could actually import a bottle from Europe with, and have a lower carbon footprint than buy one locally because they had a higher percentage of recycled glass and they had renewable energy. Mm. So we've had a, a discussion with a local glass supply in South Africa. Mm -hmm. and Did we, they return your calls? You're a lucky boy. Uh, man, <laughs> uh, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So what we're now looking is they're busy with a bottle that has a much lighter weight, okay. a higher percentage of recycled glass in it, mm -hmm. and also moving away from ESCOM power yes. to tick all those boxes. Yep. And then what we're going to have in future will be only, it won't be this, but you'll know the reserve with just the Reineke written in the glass. Mm. And we'll do that on the farm and we'll use the glass either for silica for our 501, and if we can't, we'll just put it in the compost because it's, it's sand, essentially. Yes, okay. So, so there's a bit of a, a, a brand look and feel change coming, but, mm -hmm. but you're way ahead of the curve, so mm -hmm. this will be probably only launched in 25, 2025. Okay. So we're gonna, right. when we bottle our new vintages next year in 2024, yeah. that's what we're going to do. And then as part of this relook and redesign, mm -hmm. Uh, one of the, the people who've been involved with our design and look and feel over the years is, uh, is Anthony Lane Design. And he made a very interesting comment. And he's, please do, man. I'm doing the talking <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and all the rest. But what Anthony said was, you know, your brand, you've got wines for 800 bucks a bottle and you've got wines for 300 bucks a bottle and then you've got wines for 100 rands a bottle. So it's a bit like all over the show. Yes. And then we thought, well, uh, let's see if we can do a bit of brand differentiation. So mm -hmm. our estate ones, which are these ones and the reserve ones, mm -hmm. let's do them under the, the Reineke new look and feel that we're going to launch in 2025. Mm -hmm. And then the organic range also contain our grapes, but we buy in from other organic producers as well, stylistically different. 
uh, more available in supermarkets and stuff. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can we can make a bigger separation. So that was very interesting because we then did a proper due diligence and we looked at the customer profile who bought those wines in the supermarket. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were older people and younger people, but quite a good spread of demographics. Mm -hmm. But it had quite a more than we expected, a, a following of, of, of younger wine buyers and younger wine consumers, mm. uh, which is awesome because yeah, that's, what, that's, that's what, really what we want. And that sort of goes against the trend of wine exactly. in general. Exactly. Yeah. So we thought we, perhaps a good idea to celebrate that difference. Mm -hmm. So we got young designers, mm -hmm. people in their 20s, mm -hmm. to come up with concepts for a new Weinager label. Mm -hmm. So not call it Reinecke, call it Weinager. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that it celebrates all things land caring and, and, and land sparing. Yeah. So you'll have a cow and a, and a, and a, a chicken or a duck on the label. Mm -hmm. And you'll have a, a frog and a snake and a whatever on the label as well in terms of all things biodiversity. Mm. But they will be uh, almost like in the natural wine movement look and feel new, young. And uh, initially... Less formal. Cl yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, open. Mm -hmm. inclusive, mm. accessible, and initially when I looked at them, I was like, man, are you guys crazy? You know, man, we, we can't, we, like, I don't know about this, you know. It's like, <laughs> right. I don't know. <laughs> but they've grown on me. Yeah. And I think the idea is that, you know, that's, that's how life works. Yes. Instead of, like, trying to hold on to everything and control everything, mm. it's sometimes good to also be adaptable and open for change and... Mm give new ideas and new people opportunity to also come up and flourish and shine as long as the core values of integrity and respect mm. for people and for nature and everything stays in place. I'm, I'm happy to, mm. to put it out there a bit. Yeah. Very, very cool. I've yeah. got a few more questions um, back about the farming actually. Sure. And well, the first thing I wanted to ask you about was certification Yes. Um, for organics and biodynamics. Do you do both? Yes. Okay. Why do you do, why do, you do certification? What, what's your... So I, I never yeah. bothered with it. Mm. Between 2000 and 2006, we weren't certified, although we were farming organically and biodynamically 100%. Mm. What, what prompted me was when the consumer changed, or consumer preferences changed, production follows. Yes. So as more and more people wanted sustainable and ethically produced wines, mm -hmm. Producers switched onto that, mm -hmm. but unfortunately, there was a lot of greenwashing that ensued as well. Yeah, right. And it grated me then, and it grates me to this day. What does that look like? What, what, what? It's people who claim to be sustainable or regenerative or organic. Yes, but they're not. They're not. Yeah. And I know they're not yeah. because I've been on their farms. I've had a look at their vineyards, and it's just rubbish. Yeah. And they're doing it for marketing mm -hmm. purely, and I. Mm -hmm. I cannot believe that people can lie so comfortably for money. Mm. It's, it, just, it's just, it, it just grates me as a person. Mm. So what I wanted to do was to, 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 to give a third party endorsement. It must be traceable, it must be transparent. And it's, it's, a, it's a fortune, man. We spend like mm. 100,000 bucks a year on certification. Yeah. And I'd much rather give that to the farm workers than to some multinational certification body. Yes. But in this current context, it's the only way forward. In that for sense. me, yeah. at least, and I'm not saying it for everybody, but that's where I sit on this. I, I'm really. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've spoken to Tyrrell from Nistenberg about yeah. this. He's in, on, obviously gets organically certified. I don't, I don't, I don't, yeah. know, I don't know too much about the the. And he's solid. Always been. Yeah, yeah but yes. he was explaining to me that because it's so expensive here, because there's no local certification. Yeah. You have to get. Yes. Uh, overseas. Uh, so certification bodies coming in. Is that what the expense is? Is that it is. So we don't have organic standards that are internationally recognised. Right. So we have to certify to the organic standards of the markets to which we export. The destination markets. So, so. Our destination. So we have EU organic status for Europe, mm -hmm. and we have NOP organic status for America and Canada, mm -hmm. and then we have Demeter for or Demeter for the world for biodynamics. Okay. So you have to get aud uh, audited, I guess. Yeah by two separate organic certification bodies, or is one? Exactly. Yeah. And it, it's... Uh, it's how, how similar are they? Are they, um, they or, oh, sorry, probably, probably no. a better question. How different are they? Yeah, so it's a slight difference on, on emphasis. Mm. Um, they're quite similar overall. Mm. 
Um, but for example, if you look at EU certification, they allow you to add some sulfites to the wines, mm -hmm. but NOP not. Right. So our wines can be organic wines in Europe, but mm -hmm. there will be wines made from organic grapes in America and Canada. I see, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that would be one example of differences in standards. Yes. And then what biodynamics do is they go a, a little bit further. They also look at Getting old. all of those. Uh, um, you first have to be certified organic before yes. you can. Right. That's and, then, and then they look at your social component of your business, mm -hmm. like uh, how you uh, treat your staff, where they live. Do you make work of labor contractors or do you employ people directly? Mm. Um, uh, wage, housing, all of those things. And then they also look at biodiversity. So you have to put at least 10% of your farm to nature if you want to have a, mm -hmm. a meter certification on the, on, the, on the thing. So it's, it's like the organic one, but just with a few additional uh, yeah, requirements more, as more well. Intense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and following on from that, I wanted to ask you about the camaraderie uh, yes. uh, in the industry, yes. specifically with the organic and yes. bio. I mean, is there any other biodynamically um, certified producers in South Africa? So I'm not, I'm not, to your knowledge, I mean, I'm not. Yeah, so yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sure in terms of certified, yeah. but there are a number of other biodynamic producers in South Africa. Okay. And there's quite a few organic ones who are certified and then some who aren't. Yes. But I think the camaraderie is exceptional. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. I think... When, I mean, you started, what, early 2000s? Yeah. Usterberg started probably a couple of years later, maybe yeah. 2002, I think it yeah. was. Yeah, um, Who Who else has been uh, uh, been doing it for a long time that you have a There's a, there's a, a lot of people there. Yeah, okay. um, so, I mean, Vartikluf has been organic for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, I know Longreach has been for a while. Mm -hmm. um, Algenreach was as well. I don't know if they still are with mm -hmm. the new owners. Is that right? um, I think that's their, That's one of the reasons why they bought the farm, I think. Well, yeah. there you go. Yeah. Uh, I know Avondale's been for a while. Mm. Uh, you get Orte Rock, sure. you get Willem yeah. from Stella Organics. Yeah. Um, I hope I'm not missing out on anything. No, no, I'm sure, I'm, sure I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's, there's heaps that we have missed out. Yeah, but they're just the ones that Yeah, yeah. But, but I know the Malinews are also getting their certification, unless they've already got it, but they're getting it very soon. Yep. They might For the Rubik's Rafia uh, vineyards? I th I'm not or sure exactly for which properties. Okay. But it's... There's uh, so many these days. Yeah, and, and Book and Oskliff also. Yep. They organ and my neighbours, the Turin, mm. they also certified organic. Yeah. So there's a... It's, it's definitely... It's increasing more and more and more. A tie wash, mm. of course. Yes. Uh, those guys. Mm. Um, so, yeah. A spear. I mean, come mm. on. And like we think... Yeah, spear's a big thing. Yeah, they're all just they're coming and coming and coming. But yeah. what, I, what I honestly find is there's a great rapport. Uh, people work together and they share knowledge freely. Yeah. So it's not this idea of it's my intellectual capital yes. and I'm going to protect it and this yeah. is my little market share and I'm not mm. going to give you access to it. Mm. I, on the contrary, it's the opposite. Mm. I feel we've got WhatsApp groups. Uh, if we have problems, we share them. We mm. share advice freely. Yeah. We have on-farm visits on each other's farms. Um, We've now got Wine Tech and, and Vinpro have little groups as well. That okay. Have tapped into all things sustainable, organic, and regenerative. Mm -hmm. It's definitely the industry is moving in that way increasingly. Perhaps yeah. not as quickly as it did abroad or mm -hmm. in, in Europe or in Aussie or in New Zealand, but mm -hmm. for sure uh, yeah. heading in the right direction here. Yeah. No, very cool. Yeah. Um, and do you pull resources to get the certification bodies over, or is that not something you can so what we have, So in, in biodynamics, there's a it's a, not in organics yet. Mm -hmm. um, in organics, EcoCert is one of the bodies that so you get British soil and you get SGS and you get series and you get a whole bunch of mm -hmm. them. Uh, EcoCert has now created a South African office okay. with South, Africa, South African employees paid in rands. Um, which has brought down the certification costs quite a lot. Yeah. But it's still to the EU standard, so there's still some fees and things to be paid. Yes. What Demeter has done is what they call a PGS system, which okay. is pretty cool. So they've got a participatory guarantee system. Mm -hmm. So there are okay. wineries who want to do organic uh, biodynamics, mm. but aren't 100% there yet, mm -hmm. or maybe can't afford the additional Demeter certification on top of the organic one. 
mm -hmm. like Rosie Gunn from, from, from Iona or the guys from Glen Constantia. There's a number of them in that PGS system. Uh, uh, Rob from, who passed away from Hot uh, Espoir, yeah. and a lot of really cool people, mm. uh, part of the PGS system. So what that is, is they, a group of biodynamic farmers that work together and then they basically certify each other mm -hmm. according to their understanding of the Demeter standards. Right, okay. And then every third or fourth year, Demeter will then come and then do like a... E, yeah, sort a, of audit a, it. A, a, a proper audit. Yeah, okay. Uh, as opposed to, to the yearling one, which obviously saves a fortune and, yes. and gives people the tools to really... Yeah, it's, it's funny. You know, I, I always thought I was organic and, and biodynamic until I got certified. Mm. And then I realized there were a lot of assumptions I made which were incorrect. I remember taking right. pig manure, uh, using it in the compost. Mm. I could do, I had a source of free pig manure. Mm. And I thought, well, you know, I'm not using fertilizer, I'm making compost, I'm putting it in my vineyards. And mm. as soon as I did that inspection, the inspector said, okay, you, you, pig manure, where, do they, where does it come from? And I said, there and there. And he said, well, how do the pigs live over there? You know, what are the living conditions? What food do they eat? Yes. So those were things that I didn't consider. Yeah. Which yeah, Tyrrell Tyr Tyr had the exact same. Yeah. Uh, he got manure from a non, uh, non organic, yeah. inorganic, non organic, yeah. inorganic source. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, just, just the mistakes you make early yeah. on. Yeah. And, and you only understand these things when, when they go through that very rigorous process. Yes. Yeah. And it's, it's hard sometimes because we'll get sprayed from some of our neighbors. Mm. And then they'll come and they'll start on the perimeter and they'll take leaf samples and yeah, they'll they, they know where to check, don't they? They know exactly <laughs> yeah, where yeah, to yeah. check. They hang out in the middle of the farm next to the winery. They, they, it's, it's, <laughs> it's extreme, right? Yeah, yeah. And then you'd like 30 meters of vines that you've been farming organically and biodynamically for Lovingly, yeah. 23 years and you're not allowed to use them in your wine. Mm. You've got to give them away or sell them as conventional grapes because mm. there's some spray drift. But that's, that's for the consumer so, yeah. so that they can have you know, what they see is what they get. Mm. Um, a couple of other things about the farm that I wanted to ask you about was animals. Do you get baboons uh, where you are? How do you manage that? Um, are there, there bockies and uh, other so uh, we, sort of mammals, essentially? Yeah. yeah. So, so we get, uh, we don't get baboons, okay. but we get lots of other animals and they're coming mm -hmm. back in increasing numbers. Mm -hmm. um, incredible amounts of birds of prey. I yeah. think they literally fly over from Kuchelberg uh, biosphere. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of blue cranes, lots of jackal buzzards. Mm -hmm. Got a pair of fish eagles in the dam now. Very cool. Things like that that we never mm -hmm. had before. And we've also moved some alien vegetation in the hills, some pine forests, mm -hmm. and replaced, replaced them with endemic fynbos and, and, and wild olives and things like that for mm -hmm. all things biodiversity. Yeah. We see porcupines and smaller mammals and things coming back. Mm -hmm. A lot of pockies. Mm -hmm. In terms of problems for the vineyards, um, the bokis, the little the little buck, mm -hmm. can be a problem you know, because they love to nibble on the on the shoots of the vines. Yes. So there are a few strategies we can do there. Mm -hmm. um, we do high density grazing with our cows, it's biomimicry. So it's like it's a whole different story how that works, mm -hmm. but it, we simulate what we do in nature be the predators. Right. We simulate with a little tractor battery and, and an electrical wire. Mm -hmm. And then we can also use these around the, the vines uh, for the bookies so they don't go in and eat them. Right. Okay. And then uh, I got some good advice from Christian Lewitz at Bartercliff. Okay. And he goes to the doggy parlor and he gets all the dog air and he puts that around oh. the perimeter of the vineyard and then when the little buck come they smell the dogs and they think the dog's in the vineyard and they turn around and they, right. they go past. Yeah. Um, and that's worked. It works. Yeah, right. Interesting. So, so we use ducks for snails. Mm -hmm. um, problem is that when the grapes are ripe, the, the ducks love to eat the grapes right. as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So then we've got to take <laughs> them out of the vineyard. Bit of, bit of a timing <laughs> like management months. issue there. <laughs> we have to grow yeah. grains for them so we can feed them for those two months when, you know, when they can't eat snails in the vineyards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we have a lot of snakes um, mm -hmm. come back as well. Mm -hmm. And there what we do is we, we, we relocate the, the Cape Cobras and the poisonous ones. Mm -hmm. So we'll have a, a snake catcher or handler come and collect them and then they'll put them in the wilderness. The tiny Carinas farm. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All the neighbors from yeah, yeah. And then what we'll do is like the mole snakes we leave because yeah. they're quite territorial 
and aggressive. Okay. So they then, if they're in a specific area, they'll actually keep the cobras and okay, the, the, the other ones away. Yeah, okay, right. Yeah, and then we'll put up, if we have issues with rodents, uh, put up owl boxes and mm. stuff like that. Um, so it's fascinating. It's evolving, mm. it's changing continuously. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. 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 And the other thing I wanted to ask you about was water. Yes. Uh, obviously, it was a huge issue Massive. in the Cape. Massive. Well, it remains, but obviously mm. it came to a bit of a head mm. in so 2018, 2019. Um, mm. What's your take on water? What's your status, uh, current, current status on, on the farm with water? Okay, so I think, so the area where we have has a relatively low rainfall compared to the rest of Stellenbosch. Okay. So we get about 600 mils per annum if we're lucky. Okay. And I think if you go to Yokosuk or somewhere, it can probably go a thousand or maybe even more. Yeah. yeah. So we have to be very careful about water. Mm -hmm. So what we've done is we've, well, I mentioned earlier, but through regenerative practices, soil humus, yes. the water retention increases, the mm -hmm. water runoff reduces. Mm. Uh, if you grow vines organically and biodynamically, they have smaller canopies, they have lower water requirements for optimum transpiration rates. Mm -hmm. And then we also try and harvest water. So what we're doing is we're building, drawing contours across the slope. Yeah. And all the, what we found with global warming is that it rains less often and more intense when it does. Right, okay. So the soil cannot absorb all of it. Yeah. So what we try and do then is to harvest all of that water. So we've got a top dam and a, and a lower dam, mm -hmm. and we take all the runoff on the contours to, to both dams, and then we're going to put a little solar pump with a float on the bottom dam just to slowly pump the water back up to the, the top dam in the summer. Yeah. And then it also doubles up as biodiversity corridors. So right. we found that, you know, it, in nature you get stability through diversity. So the more diverse the ecosystem, the more stable it becomes. Mm -hmm. So organic and biodynamic is more diverse than conventional agriculture, but wilderness is more diverse than organic and biodynamic. Yeah. So we've got islands that we cultivate with pockets of wilderness and diversity, and then we try and connect them with wildlife corridors and mm -hmm. these water harvesting contours. Uh, the lower wall is a two or three meter wall that you can't mm -hmm. grow anything on and that becomes an ideal hedgerow or corridor to connect the different pockets of, of, of wilderness on the farm as well. Very cool. And then in the cellar, very similar practices as uh, mm -hmm. I suppose a lot of people do. Uh, we've got a bioreactor which allows us to use all the cellar water twice. Oh, okay, very cool. Yeah, so you yeah. get all the water and all the effluent from the house and the grey water and the black water and it mm -hmm. goes through a biological system. It's then measured, uh, make sure it's fine and the E. coli levels are low and everything is it's not too acidic. Mm -hmm. And this can then go be used a second time for pasture for the cows or for yeah, building yeah. compost heaps or, or stuff yeah. like that. And then just like silly stuff, like putting a little nozzle on the end of the hose pipe in the cellar, mm -hmm. so people don't leave the hose pipe running and go and close the tap at the, at the wall. Yeah, yeah. They can just do it there. Put a trigger rather than a... Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And then also not using water to sweep the floors, but use brooms to sweep the floors and then mm -hmm. rather just uh, give it a quick rinse with just the water off. sensible stuff, essentially. Sensible stuff. Yeah. Exactly. Which, yeah. 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 Very cool. Yeah. Um, and wine itself, I mean, we've talked about all the steps leading up to wine. Do you drink much wine? I mean, you said you drink a, drink a lot of Rainica wine, which is fair enough. No, do you I drink do. much else? Or no, I do. Other stuff? I or do. What do you enjoy? I do. Um, I think there are a few wines that really made me sit up and, 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 and think about wine. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the first big influences was uh, Didier Dagano, his Silex. Okay. Um, I tasted that in 2000 in Amsterdam for the first time. Yeah. And my understanding of Sauvignon Blanc changed overnight. Mm -hmm. uh, we always had this green pyrazine style and mm -hmm. all of a sudden we just had a very different uh, understanding of Sauvy. Yeah. Um, oh, I like Syrah, I like Cornas. Um, I think if I talk about South African wine, I really, uh, yeah, I had uh, Duncan's um, Senso the other day. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that was exceptional, that freshness and the, it's just such a beautiful, fresh, alive uh, Senso. I thought mm -hmm. that was stunning. I know it's not his high end, but I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, I like Eben's wines, obviously everybody does. Uh, I think he's a top winemaker. Um, I just like, 
uh, sometimes experimental stuff as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the Cravens, uh, I think they sometimes make really very interesting expressions of cultivars that I don't often get to taste. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's good to benchmark in our area yeah. to look at what, what um, Renan does and Lucas does mm. and, and Dani does yeah. uh, with either Shannon or Sarah. Yeah. I look at their wines as well. Mm. Um, I think the Newton Johnsons are great. Mm -hmm. I think they really know how to make wine. Uh, I've been for a long time. Um, I must be careful now because now I'm starting to name people and then I start wondering yeah, who I've Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, no, uh, and also for courses, you know. Mm. I, I, I don't want to always just drink serious wine. Mm. Um, so Monday to Friday would be just something fun, mm. like a secateurs or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And then maybe something a bit more serious on the weekend that I can actually ponder over and, and think about. And yes. What I'd really like to do with uh, Barbara, our winemaker, and in fact, everybody on the farm, the cellar team, mm. is we'll just sit once a month and we'll just do blind tasting of all kinds of weird and wonderful wines we have in our, our library. Mm. And that can be anything. That can be, what did we have last month? Uh, last time we had some of Miguel Torres's wine. Okay, very cool. Um, and they're farming sustainably in Aussie. Oh, uh, okay. And they have this butterfly on the label. Oh, yes, 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 from, um, from McLaren Vale. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, Dudley and... Dudley and, uh, and, 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 and... Arena. Arena, yeah. exactly. They're, Browns. Uh, yeah. There we go. Yeah, yeah, Inkwell. That's it. There we go. Exactly. We got there in the end. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. No, they're good people. Well, they're lovely people. Yeah. And, and, and it's, uh, you know, and uh, I know Vanya, Vanya Cullen's, uh, I think it's a niece, okay. also came to visit a few times, also uh, left some wines behind. Yeah. And then we just, we just put them in the library, and then yeah. we'll just taste a few blind, and, and not know what we're tasting, where they're coming from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very and cool. they just pop up, and then it's mm. awesome. Yeah. Very cool, man. Yeah. Nice one. Nice one, man. Right, Thank you for... We've, we've covered a lot. I know. <laughs> I would. You have long been there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, Is but, there anything else you want to chat about, mate? You know what? Question? Actually, yes. Yeah. Thank you for what you, what you are doing for South African wine. Oh, oh that's easy, man. No worries. That's, that's not easy. I think it's yeah. awesome. <laughs> if I look at your portfolio mm. and I look at the people that you pre represent, mm. I think you've got an incredible um, collection of unique wine Mm. Producers, the wines are unique, but the people mm. are also. Yeah, I mean, I was incredibly lucky. I have to say, uh, I got here at the right time. Yeah. Uh, before, probably a lot of people realised what was happening in the South African wine industry, mm. and there was all these great people who didn't really have a way to market. So, I mean, uh, timing is everything, as they say. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, very, very incredibly lucky. Thank you very much. It's no, very, but, but very honestly, humbling, but yeah. Um, and I, I think you, you are yeah. showcasing a very unique aspect of South African wine. Mm. A very cool one. Um, yeah, which is uh, awesome. I like it, which is no, <laughs> I did too. Thing. Just yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cheers, Ta <laughs> yeah, mate, thanks very much. Cheers. Oh, you're welcome. Awesome. Mm. Awesome, mate. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, guys.